And I know every Friday before we get started, we usually have what I've been calling the one minute of awkward silence as we sit here for Zoom to let everyone in. Um, but this week, I'd like to take an intentional minute of silence to reflect on the new, the recent news of the discovery of the remains of the 215 children found buried in the unmarked burial sites of the former Kamloops uh, Residential School. So let's uh, have one minute of uh, reflection to mark this. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone for that. I really appreciate it. Um, and I also would like to bring your attention to an insightful post that was actually brought to my attention this morning through a very sincere post by our allies, Cambo Energy Group, which is 10 things you can do as an individual, individual for the Kamloops Indian Residential School. And it was written by Indigenous Corporate Training. And I'm just gonna share it with everyone in the chat function now. Uh, I would encourage you to, to view it. Um, so without further ado, let's get started today. Happy Friday. Uh, I'm Natalie Irwin, Director of Stakeholder Engagement here at Efficiency Canada. Uh, a reminder to everyone that our guest speaker will present today for 20 minutes, and then we're gonna open our floor to questions. So please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your Zoom screen or wait until the end and raise your hand and I can unmute you and you can ask your question yourself. So we have a hard stop at 12.45 p.m. Eastern time so that everyone can finish their lunch, breakfast, afternoon snack or dinner, depending on where you are in the country or world joining us here today. I'd like to welcome uh, Frederic uh, Biddy, who's Managing Director with the Canadian Infrastructure Bank, who is gonna give us an overview on their new commercial retrofit initiative. Uh, we're really excited to have you here today, Frederic. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here on a Friday for this session, and I will uh, try to stay within the time allocated. I'm calling you, or I'm joining you today from uh, Notre Dame de Gas in Montreal, for those uh, who are, know the area. I also would like to acknowledge the fact that uh, this is a traditional territor territory of the Kanyan Gehaga, uh, which is a place as long served as a meeting and exchange place amongst many First Nations, including the Kanyan Gehaga of the uh, Onidarsani uh, Confederacy the Uron Wendat, uh, Abenaki, and Anishinaabe. Uh, with that, uh, I uh, thank you again for having me today and letting us explain the Building Retrofit Initiative of the CIB. Uh, we'll start with uh, this presentation that we put together. Hopefully everybody is, uh, Natalie, let me know if this, this screen's not uh, showing. No, you should see okay. now. Okay, good. So you should see the Commercial Building Retrofit Initiative presentation of the CIB right now. Um, first, I'd like to maybe give the group an overview of the CIB and specifically the CIB's growth plan. We've developed the growth plan last year and um, in which we outline different initiatives of which the, C the CBRI is, is just one. Our growth plan targeted a few areas. One was the uh, zero emissions buses where we are dedicating one and a half billion dollars in investments. Another one is a $2.5 billion clean power fund. The $2 billion energy efficiency initiative, which we'll talk about today. 
a $2 billion uh, large scale broadband project initiative, which is an extension of the original $1 billion in a $1.5 billion for agriculture related infrastructure, which uh, where we made our first investment late last year in the irrigation system in Alberta. As you might already know, the CIB typically invests with uh, in infra infrastructure projects in the interest of the public, but with both public and private partners. And so we have worked uh, with provinces, territories, municipalities, indigenous communities, and uh, corporations. Focusing specifically on the Building Retrofit Initiative, the idea behind the initiative is to use or improve the efficiency of existing buildings, uh, recognizing that the building stock of 2030 and 2050 is primarily composed of building that exists today. And so we wanted to have an initiative that could focus on improving the efficiency of those. I'm gonna hold on a second, please. If you don't mind, I'm just gonna move my screen here because I feel like I'm not looking at the right place. Um, the energy efficiency uh, initiative is meant to reduce primarily greenhouse gas emissions through the reduction of uh, energy consumption through different energy reduction measures um, and fuel switching, which also is a greater impact on GHG reduction, as well as on site or behind the fence generation and storage. The CIB has two sister initiatives within, within the $2 billion, where we will work with the public sector and the private sector. We're trying to address them for, uh, in different ways, which you'll see later, uh, due to their different nature and credit quality. The intent of the CIB's $2 billion initiative is to finance the capital cost of the retrofits and be repaid through the energy and operating cost savings. So we are not providing funding, we are providing financing, so we're making investments, and they need to be repaid over the life of the project. Our two focuses, as I said earlier, are the commercial building sector, which includes all privately owned buildings, and the public sector, which is also as its own dedicated team. So focusing on commercial buildings, as I said earlier, the main intent of the initiative was to reduce greenhouse gases emission for privately owned buildings through efficiency fuel switching and on-site generation storage. We also had the objective, or still do have the objective, of transforming the market to bring in private capital in that private retrofit and go beyond the current norms or standards in place and try to push the private sector to go to, to uh, deeper retrofits and more initiative solutions. We also would like eventually our investments to create a, a sub-asset class of uh, retrofits where the CIB could eventually syndicate its participation, but also crowd in more participants in the sector, even maybe leading to a point in the market where the CIB is not needed to finance those projects. And thirdly, we also want to support other economic and social co-benefits, such as job creation, improvement of air quality, reduced energy costs, uh, affordability of housing. The initiatives followed three different uh, distinct principles. The first one is to provide attractive financing. Uh, the CIB is a financial institution. It does not provide funding. It doesn't create standards or provide incentive. We are in making investments. So the way we are doing that is through lower rates, longer tenure, and higher leverage so that those projects that have a longer payback period can now be profitable for the investors. We also would like to shift the risk of the retrofits away from building owners to the investors and the providers of services, such as the uh, engineers, contractors, and, and energy services company. And if needed, we can also facilitate off balance sheet financing or different ranking of financing in, in the second lien or subordinated uh, realm. The second um, priority or principle was to reduce investment barriers. Now, the CIB is a large invest in, investor typically focusing on multi-billion dollar projects or hundreds of millions. And so here we've lowered the bar to $25 million, but it still is, which is still a bar that is substantially higher than some retrofit projects. And so what we decided to do is try to standardize our investment process for that $25 million, but also work with aggregators 
in order to put together a multitude of projects that would add up to an amount above $25 million. Now to do that, obviously you need to standardize the investment process, which we're doing internally. We also are standardizing our own documentation and reporting so that it's easier for our borrowers to report on their financial performance and GHG production. We're also providing committed financing to those aggregators prior to the projects being fully developed so that they can go out to the market and find projects knowing that the financing is there. So part of that is to provide a level of certainty and predictability to the financing process so that people can spend the time, the money in developing that market, these initiatives, and even staffing up and training personnel. The third principle is to drive carbon saving. We are tying our debt pricing and our debt terms to the depth of the retrofit and the percentage reduction in GHG emissions. And so as such, we're hoping to promote new innovative deeper financing, or sorry, uh, retrofits. We do ask and work with our borrowers to ensure that carbon is valued. So future tax increases should be valued in, in the business model. And we also do adapt our financing terms to different sectors where needed. And that's a, that's a process that takes place uh, as we negotiate with the different investors or also through the pro the initiative at every year when we do an annual review of the program. As I mentioned earlier, there's two, well, I mentioned the aggregator principle earlier. So we, we have two ways of investing in, in retrofits. One is to work with aggregators. Aggregators, can be energy services companies, engineers, who are engineering firm, contractors that already are actors in the sector and can put together a portfolio of projects. We can work with municipalities through CPACE programs and try to develop that approach. We can work with utilities with unveiled financing. And we are working with investment firms and property management firms uh, that can create investment pools or investment funds to promote uh, the uh, retrofit investment. But we can also work with owners directly. So we are currently working with large corporations who own multiple buildings, where they are analyzing a portfolio of their buildings, 10, 15, or 20 of them. And to, together, we are setting up a portfolio approach and a standardized approach where we're setting up the financing so that they can go on and retrofit their buildings over a three, four, or five year period. The CIB typically structures projects under a what we call project finance structure, where we use a limited partnerships or special purpose vehicles where we bundle the financing. But we can work with corporates and uh, pro um, provide corporate loans also, as long as the use of the funds is dedicated to the retrofits. In terms of eligibility under the initiative, uh, we are looking, as I said earlier, to existing buildings. We want to invest in privately owned buildings uh, that have to be located in Canada. I think that um, goes with the name of the institution. And the definition of commercial buildings that are currently available could be office, retail, warehouse, uh, large multi-unit residential buildings, but primarily in the rental space so that we deal with a corporate type structure. Uh, and we also work with industrial buildings and facilities and processes. So that's uh, that's the end of that. And obviously, uh, one thing I will mention, which is is not um, it's not here. We on our website in the green infrastructure uh, scroll down menu, you will find links to both the public and the commercial retrofit initiative. Um, on that page, you will find the intent to apply form and also the applicant guide. The applicant guide is a 20-ish uh, page version of the details of what I described today, going through the eligibility criteria and also some examples of structures of aggregators and corporate loans to help guide the applicants. And we are very happy to have also one-on-one -on -one discussions with promoters of projects and building owners. Uh, this is not one of those things where you apply online and don't know where your application form goes. We, we are very interested in receiving email inquiries, uh, setting up Teams meetings, since we can't do it in person now, um, or phone calls to make sure that we understand what your project is, talk through maybe the special characteristics of your project to ensure that when you do apply through the program, um, it is eligible. Uh, and be, be uh, comforted also that 
if you do apply through the intent to apply form, it's not a year and a uh, just, uh, process. We, we do provide feedback. And so if we don't think that your form is completed as it should be, we do provide feedback and you have another chance to submit it. So and that's uh, the end of my short presentation. Perfect, thank you. I know uh, we had asked you guys to keep it somewhat short and to the point so that uh, we can get to questions because I know there's a lot mm -hmm. of questions on this from our audience today. Uh, a first one I'd like to ask is, how is the program going? How has uptake been so far? Yep. So we officially launched in February with the website coming up, I think in March. Uh, and we had been doing market soundings for almost a year, nine months. Uh, and I would say we've probably spoken to a hundred different organizations, be it prior corporations, building owners, service providers, and architects, engineers, uh, associations. So the interest is definitely there. I probably have, uh, I'd say on average, one to three uh, calls a week with people trying to want to understand better or explaining their project. Uh, we have received a, uh, a good number of applications or forms in our process, which and, and uh, uh, cleared or accepted um, a good number of them. And I think that um, you will start to see announcements of uh, MOUs and closings in the coming months, if not weeks. So things are going fairly well. And as we go through this, our team is ramping up also and our capacity is increasing to take up that interest. So, um, so it's quite interesting. Perfect. Thank you. And I should, I know there's a number of uh, new people that are joining us. So I should say uh, there are two ways to ask questions. One is to type in the Q&A box um, and we can get to your question. I'll essentially read it out loud on your behalf. The second way is to raise your hand and you can ask your question yourself. Um, the only role that we have is the same we have as for our presenters, uh, which is no sales pitches, please. Um, and that includes statements disguised as questions. Um, so another question here is actually from David is, uh, can you explain the way you lower the interest rate by using the 40-year life cycle cost of GHG tons of non-EPC measures? That's a long question. Maybe I should uh, just want to read it. So it's in your Q&A, is it? Okay. So you uh, lower the interest rate. Okay. Well, the way we lower the interest rate, uh, I guess, is we provide the interest rate. We pick the interest rate. So with the We've established our minimum GHG production per building at 30%. And our initiative allows us to work with interest rates between one and 3% during the, um, the operating period of the project. And if you can demonstrate to your to our, our technical due diligence and collaboration that you will achieve greater than 30% GHG reduction, then we can offer lower interest rate as an incentive, but also as a facilitator to achieve that 40%. It's a bit of a chicken or the egg, right? So as I provide with you with a lower interest rate, it makes the profit, it increases the profitability of the project or the payback period of the project, therefore allowing the promoter to go to those measures that might be more expensive and have a longer payback, like a geothermal versus changing light bulbs, for example. Uh, we also can play with the tenor and the, the, the maturity of the loan rather than do a 10-year loan. We can do a 15-year loan or a 20-year loan. And so by extending those repayment terms and therefore reducing the amount of debt service over the years, then we can help ab uh, amortize the capital costs over a longer period and therefore helping you reach those greater GHG savings. So hopefully that, that helps with the context. It, it basically makes... Uh, frees up more capital for the equity investors in the early years because our debt service is low. Perfect. Thank you. I think that was a great answer. And I, uh, David, if you have any further questions on that, uh, Federic mentioned that he you can reach out to him directly or to his team as well. I think he's going to provide his personal direct number in the chat. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, later on. Um, so I do actually have a great question. I saw that Ben actually answered it, but I still want to ask so that everyone can uh, benefit from learning is great presentation. Um, will this program, so the CIB um, commercial retrofit program, be available to municipal and indigenous governments? So uh, just two answers to this, maybe even three, all positive. 
municipally owned buildings uh, can be financed through the public stream of our building retrofit initiative. So the answer is yes on that one. And so uh, again, on our website, we have the two streams there with contact information. And we have a team that's dedicated to financing public sector buildings because they do have slightly different characteristics of credit quality, procurement process and, and rules. So yes, some municipalities. On the uh, indigenous um, project, we also have, or and announced a few weeks ago, a $1 billion initiative to address uh, indigenous community projects. And the way that works, it's not that they do necessarily different things, it's that they have uh, a team specialized in understanding the dynamics or maybe the challenges and also working with the smaller scale of indigenous projects, but across the same sectors of the rest of the bank. And so our indigenous initiative team, or we'll call the ICI team, um, it, when they receive inquiries about, let's say, a private a commercial building retrofit, then they'll work with us. And so we'll have a team of retrofit expert and indigenous investment expert so that we can work with the communities and put in place those projects that may be smaller than $25 million. Um, and so, so we can end, we can you know, copy paste or we can uh, you know, move things around in the right bucket to make sure that it works. So we'll cover public sector, private sector and indigenous, which in many cases falls into the public sector anyways. But yes, the answer is a resounding yes. That's great. I, I said that you're allowed to say you don't know. You're allowed to say that twice, by the way. I didn't let you know. <laughs> Um, but it's nice when you get to say yes, for sure. Um, we actually have a great question here from Chris, which this might be one of your, your two I don't knows, but what happens when the two billion runs out? We get more. <laughs> there you go, I like that answer. Uh, Peter here has a, a question on, what challenges are you seeing in terms of uptake and using the funds? Um. The challenges vary a bit from um, challenges. So there's a couple of things. One of the challenge is that retrofit programs, retrofit projects and financing has been usually done in the public sector. And when we address the private sector, we have a much more fragmented market. So you need, we need to talk to a lot of those conferences here to make sure that it's better known. And the variety of the project is also greater. And so it does take more time for both parties, us and you, to make sure we understand each other. What can we do for you? How can we adapt and, and fine tune our investment? And what can you bring to us to explain your investment? So there's a lot more customization. It is an investment, right? It's not an incentive program. It's not a dollars per measure. It's an investment. So we need to understand what it is that you're doing. So, so there's a challenge there associated with fragmentation and customization which result effectively in just maybe a little more time, time spent together to understand your investment and making that investment. So that's that's one big challenge, I think, which is not insurmountable, obviously. Um, I think the other challenge is to think outside the box and target those 30% GC reduction projects or 45 or 55 or 67, uh, where I think we, as, as most investors would, tend to go through the low hanging fruits and look for the lightings or, or, or cladding or different things or fuel switching. Now we need to think creatively. What we do on our side to help with that is we look at the project as a whole, not on each measure separately. So we can work with the developers or the promoters to be more creative about it. So fragmentation and then you know challenging yourself. Um, after that, it's the fact that this has not been done before on a large scale, I think, in the way that we're trying to do it. And so to be honest, I get calls once in a while, and once in a while that I feel like I, I get a curveball. Oh, I didn't think about that. So we need to work with our promoters. Uh, often it's a tweak, it's a modification, it's a negotiation, it works. Sometimes it's something that falls outside of our initiative as of now, and we can look at it through our annual review process. And sometimes it just falls outside of the bank's mandate, and that's just the way it is, and we can't do it. And so, so there's there's growing pains, but the I think the the, the upside is that. The bank is here to innovate and be flexible. And whatever we can do today, we always put aside in the hmm, to think about list. How can we think about this in the future? And so I think you'll get an open mind uh, when, when you talk to us and bring your ideas. But you need to challenge yourself though. You need to go and seek that 30% plus GHG reduction. That is the ultimate goal. That's right. I like that you have, a, I'm gonna call it your wish list. 
that you have <laughs> set aside, or maybe others wish lists. <laughs> um, it actually is a great segue. Um, and this might be um, something, again, you, you might be able to point people in the right direction here. We'll see. A question here from Chris is, with a 25 million yes. threshold, <laughs> the program seems geared towards larger building owners. Um, any thoughts on how this program could support smaller owners such as Class B and C buildings and where there be other Canadian infrastructure bank opportunities or programs for these owners in the future as they are in need of support as well? Okay. So the fundamental uh, building, one of the fundamental building principle of the initiative is the aggregator principle. Uh, for two, so so the it is not designed for larger building owners because larger building owners already have money. In fact, often they have cheap money, and and in fact they don't need us. Uh, some of them we still work with some of them uh, because we go to uh, buildings that haven't touched or or sectors of the building portfolio that they have that's different. So we do work with the, some of the larger ones, but it is not the primary target. The primary target is the class B and C. Uh, it's also that those buildings that are owned by people whose job is not to manage buildings. And But how do you address that? That is exactly what we're trying to do here. We're trying to go through aggregators so that they are the ones interacting with the class Bs and Cs. So when I work with um, an energy serving, uh, services company that creates a pool or an engineering firm or a contractor or a financial investor, when they create this aggregation vehicle, this portfolio of projects, and I lend 25, 50, or 100 million dollars to that pool, then it can interact with the smaller projects. And those projects can be half a million dollars, a million, five, and two. That's their business decision on how they address the market. My job is to be the wholesale financier, the white label bank, or call it what you want, behind those different aggregators. And so a dream scenario is I would get 10 to 20 to 25 aggregators out there in Canada with all the different mandate. Somebody said, might say, I'm going to focus on offices in Ontario. Somebody else might say, I'm going to do retail restaurants and retail across Canada, or I'm going to do all the maritime provinces. Right? And, and those aggregators then can bring the expertise that they have, the financing that they have through us and their money, and go to you, the building class Bs and C owners or retail owners, and pitch the idea to you. I'm going to retrofit your building. Here's what I'm going to do with it. Here's how we're going to share the savings. Oh, and by the way, don't worry about it. I got the financing. That's the idea. That's the momentum we want to build so that on our website, someday you'll see the CIB is now investing in this aggregator, that one, that one, that one. And then if you have a smaller project, you don't call me, you call one of them. Because you will see that these aggregators are in your geography or in your business sector, and they should come and pitch the idea to you. They should come and retrofit your building and sign a contract with you. So that's that's what we're trying to do. I'm trying to take my team of a handful of people and effectively buy myself or outsource to 50 or 500 people in a sector that have technical and financial expertise to do the work in your building. That's a fantastic way of looking at it and explaining it. Um, uh, kind of a follow-up question to that is, who are the ideal retrofit solution providers who should work with the bank? So is it utilities and crown corporations who cooperate with efficiency, who operate efficiency programs, or would they work in partnership with the private providers? So the, the there's two, okay. So there's the first question is who's my borrower, who's my client, and in that case, in most cases, it's the private sector. It's not the utilities and, and crown corps. The borrower is the aggregator or the building owner. So I want the private sector to be my main source of partnerships. They create these pools. They come to us. So that's engineering firms, escos, contractors, promoters, entrepreneurs, whatever you want, right? Those are the the main partners for us. That being said, I must spend about a third of my time talking to utilities, municipalities, provinces, um, and other public and parapublic entities because they are great promoters of our initiative, right? Where they have ESG goals or GHG reduction goals 
but they don't own the buildings. So they are great facilitators to, for me to interact with the private sector. So utilities refer us to large emitters or large clients. Uh, municipalities give us information on which sector they think their city might, might, might need more help. Or, and we're also talking about the CPACE programs potentially. So those are great partners from a development origination relationship perspective, but rarely a financial partner. The financial partners for us are really the private sector. Um, I, I was going to ask you one question, but you mentioned PACE. So there's a question actually here from yeah. Stephanie on PACE. Is, can you provide more information on how the aggregated approach would work with municipal C uh, PACE program? So we'll not use an I don't know, but I will use a partial yes. Um, so we're still working through that, to be honest. I mean, there's not a lot of cities that or provinces that have the um, legislation in place. We are talking municipalities. The basic principle, though, is this: is that a municipality with a C-based program is a great one. It's a great sales force, right? It promotes the you the, the retrofit model. So that's one way to do it. The other thing that the, the C-based program does is very interesting to us. It collects payments. And, it, and the payments follow the building. So it reduces default risk or it improves the credit quality of the risk. So that is known. The next question then is who are we lending to? We wanna lend to an aggregator that, that performs the work. So we're still working with some municipalities on how we're gonna do that. Uh, the one way to do it is create, as I said before, an investment vehicle with the private sector where they invest and we go and perform the retrofits, but that the municipality collects the payments and remits the payments to the SPV. Now, I don't know if that's been done before. That's no one way to do it. The other way to do it is for the municipality to, to perform the loans and a typical or pays program. And then we will be the lender to the municipality. Um, that's a challenge because we want a crowd in private capital. And so we need to see where the private capital would, would act there. So the answer is we're still working through the details. And we, we've put it out there because we knew there was an interest for it and we want to work, well, we are working with municipalities to try to find the right solution on that front. Very interested to hear ideas on that, uh, but we think it's a great source of marketing and origination of transactions. It's a great way to reach smaller businesses. It's a great way to reduce the risk for the investors through the collection of payment from municipality. Uh, you know, I think it's going to take a little more time to put that into place because municipalities have their own processes. Uh, but if that picks up momentum, it's going to be a very interesting vehicle. Definitely. Um, I have a question, a very popular question here from Thomas is, okay. would a district energy system retrofit be considered as part of this program? So it would if, if you retrofit or if your work is done in the building and reduces the 30% GG reduction of the building using your district energy. That being said, don't forget that the CIB works in across different sectors. We do work in clean energy, uh, storage and other things. So we actually do work with district energy companies or looked at district energy projects also from a different initiative. And so we are very interested in, in I guess the idea would be that it really depends where you draw the line of where the project is. So some people call it at the heat exchanger, call it a property line at the auto mine. Uh, what's outside the property line, that's where you district energy, what's inside the property might be a retrofit. Now, the goal of making distinction here is not to punt it over the fence of someone else and not do it, quite the opposite. The goal of having, of mentioning the fact that we have these two initiatives is that ideally we'd work together and, and make it even more likely to happen. Um, we don't like to not say we don't like saying no to a project. We like to we like to find why is ways to say yes to a project uh, if it delivers the goals that we that we are seeking, which in this case is GEG reduction. So uh, district energy is definitely interesting. We just need to decide you know, where the work is done and how it's financed. I love that you guys take a not yet <laughs> approach versus <laughs> versus no. That's fantastic and refreshing to hear. Um, a, a question here from Namish is, uh, how does existing loan or mortgage on properties factor into this program? Is there any sort of lender consent approval required? So if we, uh, if we do it through an aggregator, we lend to the aggregator, the SPV, and it signs an energy performance contract or energy sharing contract. And so we're not lending to the building. We're not taking security in the building. We're taking security on the SPV's contracts. 
And so, uh, and then the building has a contractual relationship with the SPV. So we don't interfere with mortgages or first liens. If we lend directly to a commercial owner of a portfolio, that can also be done at the corporate level rather than at the uh, building level. We can be second lien and, and we can work through different security packages. And so there may be still some consent and non-disturbance agreement in some cases, but we don't seek to be, um, to be senior on these projects. Okay, perfect. I actually have someone raising their hand. I mentioned them earlier, Campbell Energy Group. So Arif, I'm going to uh, allow you to talk here if you want to ask your own question. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you can, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. That was a great presentation. Uh, my question relates to uh, remote indigenous communities who, as you know, many of them generate their power through diesel, which produces a lot of greenhouse gases. Um, funding for the diesel comes from indigenous services. And my, my challenge is really that the community in itself may not be able to repay the loan amount because indigenous services links payments to buy diesel to the actual amount or close to the amount that the, the amount diesel that's used. And so I'm concerned that, that that how do we how do we address this so that indigenous community, oh, sorry, indigenous relations uh, also are part of this this uh, this um, program, which is really great, but they the danger is that if they, if the community's diesel consumption drops, then the, the amount of money coming from indigenous services drops as well. How do we how do we break that conundrum? Thank you. So uh, it's a very detailed question, and I, there's two. I, I hear two questions in, in your question. One is of coordination between federal departments and, and sitting down, which, to be honest, uh, has been. Uh, we have amazing relationship with our sister departments, or uh, in in finding ways where this, the benefit of the CIB in providing financing is that it often reduces the need for funding because we provide efficiencies in how we finance the projects, then funding required is sometimes less. And so our, the other departments in the federal government are usually very keen on working with us because it reduces the amount of money they need to spend on any particular thing. And so when looking at a community as a whole and, and taking a public view of the world, it's easy for us to sit down with that community and, and Indigenous Services Canada. So, uh, that's, so that's just a, a commentary maybe. Um, now, the energy generation on site to me is not a retrofit issue. It's really a clean power or off diesel issue. So we do have our indigenous initiative and our clean power fund looking at uh, ways to reduce uh, GHG production or generation on uh, remote communities or, or off grid. And so that is an active sector where we're, at, we're working in order to reduce dependency to diesel. Uh, and I guess my last comment on this, now, if you did that retrofit in the building and reduce your energy consumption and therefore reduce your diesel need, then why would you need a, a indigenous services to maintain the same amount of, fu of funding? I mean, you've reduced your consumption, so you don't need more money. So I'm not sure why there's a disconnect in here and between the two. If you're reducing energy consumption, you don't need as much money. Can I, can I answer this sure. first? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. So yeah, um, you, you, you've still got to fund the loan that, that, that infrastructure that you've provided, right? So that money has to come from somewhere. So that's one point, that the Indigenous services reduces the cost. So yes, your diesel cost has gone down, but your retrofit, you, the loan amount still has to be paid back. So that's one uh, point. Uh, the other one is, I, I'm not sure I totally agree with you that the Renewable Energy Initiative can actually provide sufficient energy to, um, to, to power a remote community. I've worked in lots of communities and there just isn't the capacity either solar or hydro to do that. And so, and, and buildings use about 70% of the energy, residential buildings use about 70% of energy in, in, in communities and they're in a pretty bad state. And so there, there, there's like one of these things that I, I, sorry to say, but I don't think, the, the the details are understood uh, in government so no thank you for clarifying your question so uh, what you're really pointing to here is a public retrofit conundrum or a problem where you have the public uh finance here which in this case is isc public paying for the diesel and if we were to finance a project reducing that energy the energy saving is really benefiting 
the fund, the buyer of the diesel, right? And so that project is, is, a, is, is a great example of a public retrofit where we need to work with the people who pay for the energy. In this case, it would have to be, you know, a discussion between the community, ISC and ourselves as to we're lending to retrofit or reduce GHG reductions, who's gonna pay for that loan? And it has to come from energy savings and who benefits from the energy savings? Well, in this case, it would be Indigenous Services Canada. So this is exactly the dynamic that we see on the public retrofit side. And so that's the type of discussion we would have. As for the renewable and versus diesel discussion, it's very site specific. I agree with you that a lot of communities who move to renewable also keep diesel as backup uh, or as, as makeup or as peak power. There's different solutions for different jurisdictions and hard to you know, detail the, uh, the discussion here on a, on a broader discussion. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for those answers and uh, Ari, for your for your questions on that. Uh, I know you did touch on this already, but I want I see there's a number of questions on this, so I just want to uh, have you say it again, just to clarify for people that are listening in. Um, there's reference to focus on the program being for both commercial and public facilities, but from the eligibility criteria, it appears that only privately owned buildings yep. are eligible. Can you? No, so the initiative. Yeah. So I just spoke about the the commercial initiative. Yeah. That was the focus of this session. Uh, we have another presentation. Uh, I can talk about the public side. So if you if you go on our website, you will see that they're retreated differently, and they're treated differently, as I said earlier. Uh, or maybe not enough details. But I'll tell you now. Uh, the public sector already has aggregators, right? Municipalities are aggregators. Provinces, provinces, provinces are aggregators. They own portfolios. You know, health systems or networks are aggregators, and so we work directly with them. They also have a very different credit profile. Uh, which is usually a better credit profile than many of the private sector owners. Uh, and they have procurement rules. They have to follow certain processes to give out services contract or, or uh, construction contracts. And so we work with the public sector in a slightly different way, but we do work with both. They're just in, in, uh, in, in different uh, methods and different financial products. Perfect. Thank you for that. Um, I know there's a lot of questions, so people, I thought I'd ask the questions so you could clarify for, again, um, one last question here is uh, from a, a landlord I know we have on the line here is, I have a retrofit that has been audited and designed that meets ICP slash IREE requirements. Mm -hmm. How long, uh, and this might be one of your, it depends, <laughs> how, how long to complete the CIB's review and get initial funding? So my stock answer is three to six months because that's my answer to everything. Uh, that's an answer based on experience. Yeah, you have to provide us with the application and then we'll look at your project and then it's a matter of due diligence, right? We need to, obviously the IRE helps, uh, but we need to make sure that you have, uh, where's your equity coming from? Where are your engineering plan and, and the like? Uh, negotiate a credit agreement. But if you have everything ready to go and that one building is also bigger than $30 million in retrofit because we need to hit our minimum 25 million, uh, that's probably the like, Sounds like an ideal scenario, so you'd be closer to three months and six months, I hope. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's that's sort of the time frame that I, I would put on this. But the reality is that people come to us with more than one building, and sometimes also with a few identified buildings, but a, also a pipeline of others. And so that discussion on the business plan and standardization of approval of a project takes a little more time. Mm -hmm. I think that's definitely fair to say. <laughs> Every case is different for sure. Um, so thank you again so much. I know there's a lot of uh, chat going on, so how great the presentation was and how in, uh, informative the, the question and answer period was. I know our audience really appreciates you coming on and just being willing to just answer any question that was thrown your way. And you, uh, you're definitely allowed to come back because you didn't use either one of your I don't knows. Um, so <laughs> we're happy to have you back anytime. Um, so again, thank you. Uh, and if anyone's interested in uh, presenting, our presenters each week are other charity or not-for-profit organizations, uh, along with our allies. So if you're curious about joining Efficiency Canada as an ally, you can find information on our website or feel free to reach out to myself directly for details. Uh, and next week, I'm actually going to be taking Friday off. Uh, but our executive director, Corey Diamond, is going to take over a uh, discovery session, and he's going to be joined by the team at Ontario's IESO to hear about Ontario's first ever energy efficiency auction. 
that is testing ways to increase energy efficiency's contribution to the grid reliability and support consumers in designing solutions that best fit their needs. Again, another really interesting and insightful session. I look forward to watching, watching it, even though I'm on vacation. So thank you again for joining us here today. Uh, enjoy your weekend, everyone, and take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a nice weekend.